Cybercrime Awareness for Remote Workers. That was about the third version of the title that I came up with. Um, basically, um, today we're going to do a, a brief version of the Cybercrime Awareness course, uh, which is focused on remote workers. I'm not just reading this off the screen. <laughs> but, um, <laughs> it's, the idea of today is that um, rather than doing the full course, which um, I'll talk about in a minute, um, this is just going to be a trimmed down version. And I was kind of aiming at about 20 minutes, half an hour, because I know it's quite a dry subject anyway. Um, and also, hopefully some of you at least have attended the full version. And so um, won't want to sit for me showing you every kind of email that you can get caught out by. Um, so it's going to be a briefer one, and I'm going to skip over a few things. But if you want more detail or if you've got any questions, you know, just, just shout and then um, we can cover that straight away. Um, as always, you know, it, should, it would definitely be done within an hour because anything over that is excessive. Um, but I think it's more likely to be about 30 minutes. Um, quizzes and questions throughout makes it sound exciting. But basically, I will um, I'll ask, we'll, we'll do a few pages of questions just to make sure that you've not got it off. Um, and um, at any point, as I keep saying, if you've got any questions, just ask. So that's today. The usual course, um, it covers the things that we're going to talk about today, but in a little more detail and a lot of other things that we that aren't necessarily um, focused on home workers or remote workers. Um, that's a course that you should attend anyway. And if you've attended it before, then you're always welcome to attend it again, just in case new things have been added since you've experienced it. Um, I always say it's essential for all users because it literally is, because anybody can get caught out, whether they're someone who uses a computer once a month um, or whether you sit there all day in front of your PC. There's okay. a cat outside um, yelling now. Can you hear that cat? There's one of the Campo cats. There's wild cats in this part of the universe. And, uh, yeah. Anyway. Um, <laughs> You've got an extra person now because my daughter has joined us. Oh, good. Morning. Um, but, you want to wait? But um, yeah, I mean, Janice, just turn your camera on, then we can wave. Um, the um, there we go. I can see your initials at least. The um, yeah, the regular yeah. course. You still haven't got your camera on. <laughs> it is on now. <laughs> it oh. is on. All right, well, it's not come up yet. Maybe that's just my um. Taking it, it's spinning. I need my new laptop, Glenn. <laughs> yeah. Oh, well, I'm sure. Oh, yeah, laptops are really easy to get hold of at the moment. <laughs> but, um, <laughs> morning, you <laughs> can see you now. <laughs> hey, all right, I will get this presentation done. Um, so, <laughs> so yeah, the usual course we do it as a webinar or do it in the office. The benefit of going to the office is, of course, you get sandwiches uh, or get a, a cold, depending on. Uh, what the current climate's like. Um, but anyway, moving on. So, in brief, I'm not going to talk about the effect on the corporations and um, all the different talks about the you know, things about productivity and, and such dangers because those things are more about the company as a whole. Um, today, what we're really concerned about are the direct dangers when you're working from home. They want to steal your money, simple as that. Um, the bad guys want to steal your money, they want to steal the company's money, and if they can't just grab hold of that money, um, they want to create a path to stealing that money. Um, and by a path, I mean things like stealing passwords, being able to pretend to be you, uh, dupe somebody else, um, by um, causing problems with your computer so that um, you're vulnerable because you might have to turn off the firewall or turn off the antivirus protection. So all these things are essentially, they're all about um, separating you from either your money or the company's money. And um, quite often people say, like, oh, I know the difference between a real email and, and a, a scam email. I don't need to do any of this training. Um, but those are the same people that get caught out. And in our experience, the people that caught out, that get caught out, um, sometimes it's a couple hundred pounds or maybe 400 pounds. But more often, when it's company's money, it tends to be between ten and twenty thousand pounds. So these are real figures. Um, the other thing is, uh, if you look at Kent as a whole, um, I think it's something like thirty million pounds losses reported every year to the police, or it's in excess of thirty million pounds. 
And so uh, this is real money. This isn't about people going, like, oh, our production costs have gone up. This is yeah. money being taken out of accounts. What I'm going to do now that Janice has got a camera going is I'm going to mute your mic so that you don't feel stressed about background noise. So you can shout as much as you like now, Janice, we can't hear you. Uh, but if you wave, then I'll unmute it when you um, <laughs> uh, say something. So these are dangers. It is about them taking money, and it is real money. So, oh, that was a wrong button. Hang on a minute, I was on the wrong screen then. Right, yeah, back to the right screen. <laughs> Very slick, this, uh, this version of the performance. So, the remote office, the home setup. There's a few things we need to consider about this to, um, to protect yourself, to make you in a better position to work. Ideally, all the equipment that you work on should be company owned. Now, um, for a lot of us, that's fine because, you know, we've either we're using company laptops or it's our company and that sort of thing is absolutely, uh, um, you know, just default. Um, but for some people, they're using their, their own stuff um, and they're kind of doing it as a favour to the company or some people, you know, are furloughed and they've not got company kit anyway. Um, but if you're using company kits, then, of course, it is covered by all of your company's protection. Um, which in many cases, or hopefully everybody's case on the screen, um, is, um, you know, is all of us, you know, all of our kids should be covered by, you know, JJ's um, you know, level of protection. If you are using your own equipment, then it's also important to make sure that's protected. And I don't just mean, oh, we get the free virus with virus protection with Windows, that's all right, or there's a firewall somewhere, I've seen it switched on. I mean, proper virus protection. I don't mean something that you download off the internet because it's it's cheap and it's got good reviews. Um, I mean, real virus protection that, that not only is regularly updated, but is also monitored. Um, the good news is, um, what applies to all of us here, is if, even if you haven't got um, the standard virus protection that we provide, um, then if you haven't got that on your home PC, for example, then at the moment you can have that anyway. And you've just got to ask support. I mean, there's a big old asterisk on this. Um, but if you're um, one of our clients or if you're whatever it says down there, key workers, friends, family of clients, whatever, or family of clients or friends of the company, we'll provide it for free. And it's not a free bit of software. It's, it costs money. It's a proper bit of software. But the advantage of having this virus protection, apart from the fact it's really good, is that um, normally we'll know about the viruses before you do because it's monitored. So it's looked after by us. Um, so. That's a really important thing to have at home. It's important to have a firewall. If you're installing a piece of software or you're adding a printer or something, a little message pops up and says you need to switch your firewall off before continuing. Sometimes that is true and sometimes you do have to do that. But the most essential thing is get that firewall back on as soon as possible and then restart the PC. Because when you switch your firewall off, although it's a great way of allowing software to talk to devices and things and set up paths to your printer, the second that firewall is off, the whole world is on the same network as you. The whole of the internet can see your computer. And if somebody wants to access your hard drive, um, they've got a fairly good chance to do it. So you want to keep that uh, window of opportunity as small as possible. So the next thing is your network itself uh, must, you know, needs to be secure to be um, uh, safe working at home. And by network, I don't necessarily mean that you've all got like five station networks and cables dangling everywhere, and file servers and stuff, although, I'm sure some of my colleagues have. Well, I know some of my colleagues have, um, <laughs> because that's the kind of thing that computer people often do, not me. Um, but um, I mean, even if you've just got your laptop and a wireless router, that's still a network. Now, a network is uh, something that lots of things can be attached to, whether you want them attached or not. And so this is why it's important, it needs to be secure. The best connection you can have to the internet is from your computer, to the router via a nice big thick um, cable because that will give you the fastest most secure connection um, that's not practical in most homes most homes will use wireless but if you can get away of not using wireless that's great um, wireless if it's switched on which like i can say most homes you're going to have it switched on so you can use your mobile you can use other devices all around the network um, that means the second that's switched on it's not as secure as it could be doesn't matter how good your wireless is, people can hack it. That's just a fact. Um, so uh, the best thing to do is to restrict what device is attached to your wireless network. Now, some people will think like, well, I'll give them a key out to anybody. Why should I lend people 
I've let people use my wireless. If they're in my house, they can attach their phone. They have the, if the kids are here, they've got their console and their laptops on there. If kids' friends are here, they can attach their laptops. What harm can it do? Well, the problem is it can do a lot of harm. Just because it's wireless, it's, it's, it's not any different than having a cable plugged in. And you've got to think about all these devices that are getting attached to it. Even if you've got a super fast internet and you've got fantastic virus protection, you've got firewalls all over the place. You may have everyone in your household have really well protected devices. The kids might have brilliant protect, protected, nice, clean devices. Everything's fine. But if one of their friends comes in and they've got some manky, virally infected, horrible bit of tech, and they say, oh, can I have your wireless key? And they go, yeah, sure. It's like then plugging that thing into your beautiful, clean work computer. It doesn't matter how well protected your computer is. Viruses are clever things. And that might just decide to burrow its way straight into your computer and do all kinds of damage. And that sort of stuff has happened. We've had people who've experienced that. And they're like, how does this happen? It's like, well, if you go around giving your key about, like, um, like a badly told secret, then people might attach. I mean, you can get really technical with your home network. Um, and I don't expect you to do that. Um, but a sensible thing is to reboot the router on a, you know, on a regular basis because you suddenly find that your net, your internet connection improves because you'd be amazed. If you ever looked at the logs, you would be um, horrified at the number of intrusion attempts that you get into your network. And it would be from places like China and Russia and the Middle East and Margate, um, you know, all kinds of horrendous places. Um, but... Um, but they, but they try to get in, and sometimes they do, sometimes they don't, sometimes they get in, they find nothing, sometimes they care, but all these things um, can add to the burden of your internet connection, slow it down. So restart it occasionally, and if you're sufficiently nerdy, feel free to go in there and have a look and see what devices are attached. And it's not uncommon to find out a neighbour has somehow got onto your wireless network, and then um, has been using it for the last two years. I certainly know with one of my neighbours, I used there for two years, that's not important. Um, <laughs> the important thing was, save me a fortune. Oh. Anyway, um, so yeah, that's wireless networking. Be careful about who you attach and then have a look and see who is attached if you know how to do that sort of thing. Moving on, VPNs. These are really important. They come in all sorts of different flavours and have all sorts of different purposes. Um, but a lot of people say, what's a VPN? Isn't that something to do with, like, if I'm wearing a certain kind of clothing? It's like, no, no, not a VPL. VPN is um, it's a technical thing. Well, I suppose a VPN is as well. But anyway, this is more IT orientated, and it's about um, protecting the the, uh, the traffic from your device um, to the you know, through the internet. I'm not going to explain it in detail because I had said I was going to do this as a brief presentation. But basically, it means that rather than the information from your device um, to the server that it's talking to being transmitted in plain text that the bad guys can see. Um, a VPN puts it through a tunnel so that um, no one can see who you're talking to or how you're talking to them. Um, that's got all kinds of benefits in in uh, the real world. So if you are staying in a hotel, for example, remember how we used to stay in hotels many years ago? Um, <laughs> one day again, apparently, it might be available. Who knows? Um, if you're using their internet connection, it's really dodgy. But if you want to be a little bit safer, using a VPN will protect the traffic that's going through their internet connection. If you're abroad and you want to pretend you're not abroad, like for example, if I want to use iPlayer from Spain, if I'm here in Spain or um, any <laughs> other device, you can't do that when you're outside of the UK because it's not allowed. We've to buy a UK lottery ticket. Um, but if you use a VPN, you can make it pretend that you're in London and then, um, and then use it for that purpose. However, from a bad guy point of view, a VPN can be handy because it can um, hide your traffic um, it can protect it from being seen, and also it can allow you to connect to a company network. So quite often um, we we'll use VPNs, and you would probably have seen VPNs in place um, for when you want to um, connect to your um, network in the office, but you don't want um, you don't want anyone in the outside world connecting to them. So you connect to a VPN, you become part of that network effectively, and then anything you do is the same as if you're sitting at your desk in the office. So that's what VPN is all about. There's all sorts of different kinds of VPNs for different purposes. Sometimes you might um, decide you want a VPN for personal use, like you want to buy lottery tickets while you're abroad or use iPlayer. Um, other times you might have been advised that you should have a VPN um, just to um, protect your data for the kind of work that you're doing. Um, 
There's a thumb over that camera, definitely. <laughs> <laughs> anyway. <laughs> Uh, I need to take it off now, good. Um, sometimes you want to turn your VPN off, um, or if you're doing remote access. So for example, if you're doing something um, like a video conference or something like this, and you, um, you spend all day at your work PC in your home office, attached to your work PC at your desk, um, and then you want to do something like this where you want to use your microphone, you want to use your camera and all that sort of stuff. Then at that point, it's important to uh, disconnect from the remote PC because if you're using remote desktop connection, it will think um, that you're um, that you're sitting at your PC in the office and then the camera and, uh, and the microphone and stuff won't work properly. So a lot of people have that experience. Um, also, a VPN can slow things down slightly. So if you're just doing something like Know, streaming music or streaming video or um, doing this kind of presentation then um, at that point sometimes it's worth just disconnecting from a VPN because it will speed things up a bit. Anyway that's enough about VPNs. If you want to know more feel free to ask. <laughs> um, so these cyber criminals then and, and uh, how they're getting in. Um, um, quickly go through some of the, the key things. Um, yeah, and I, <laughs> you're laughing at the image. <laughs> yeah, blindly. <laughs> I said to um, to Emily yesterday, can you, can you, well, I said to the media department, I mean, um, can you um, spice this up a bit? So she put a lot of um, cyber related images on there, and then I've just sorted some appropriate um, slides. Um, but yeah, the, the, the big ways of them getting in. Uh, email, the same old, you know, the same old uh, way that they've always got in. The email is always very popular, but now there's all kind of new scams. Um, but we'll go for that in a minute. Um, video conferencing, oh, that's a big danger. Anyone does something crazy like video conference, I'll come to that in a minute. Online purchasing, again, there's always the same old scams there, and then invoice scams and WhatsApp scams. So I'm just going to explain what all these bits are. Like I say, any points, if any of it needs explaining, just ask. Emails. This has always been the way that cyber criminals have um, done the most damage. There's all sorts of things they can do, and the most popular ones are um, trying to get a bit of software onto your computer. So you'll click on something and you'll download a piece of software, which will be malicious software and malware. But effectively, you'll be installing a virus out of choice, um, or something where they're trying to get you to give up your password. Um, by conning you to log into the bank or log into Amazon or log into PayPal, but it's not really PayPal you're logging into. Instead, you're just handing over your PayPal password. Um, or a cute one, which is always very impressive. Um, and uh, this was one that cost somebody about, I think it was 21 grand or it might be 19 grand, um, is website redirection. And um, what this will do is you click on the link because you're following whatever link they've duped you into following. Um, and then it puts a little bit of code in there so that whenever you go to any of the banking websites you normally go to, you go, you end up going to a fake one instead. And then you type in all your codes and then people can do bad things. So these are the kind of things they're doing. Um, now, I'm not going to go through pictures and pictures of emails giving you examples. Um, if you want that, come on the full course <laughs> for the last two hours. Um, but what we'll do is run through um, the, uh, the general gist of it. First of all, the sender, depending on your system, if you hover over the sender name, oh, got it, that's a fly. Um, no, I didn't get it. Anyway, um, <laughs> if you hover over the sender name, it will tell you who it genuinely thinks the sender was, uh, the email was from. That isn't always genuine, but if you hover over it and it says something really outrageously obvious that ends with .ru or, or dot, I don't know, something that isn't code UK, then it might raise the alarm bells. Things like if you've been sent an email from ebayuk.com, which is nothing to do with eBay, or um, sagetop.com, that was one I saw. And it was another popular one. Um, can't remember. Anyway, you get these ones that, oh, Amazon, which of course is nothing to do with Amazon, but it looks like it's come from Amazon because if you look at it quickly, it looks genuine. So I hover over the sender name. It is so easy to put a fake name in there, but those normally get picked up. But that's a good start. Then there's the title. Quite often the titles are a big giveaway, but quite often the software that filters these things 
we'll do it by the title and we'll catch it before you even see it. Um, and so what the bad guys do in their phishing emails is they'll often misspell the title intentionally. It's not because they can't speak English, it's because if they uh, replace, um, well, if they, if they have um, uh, an L where there should be an I or a one where there should be an L, um, then it's no longer the same title. And then sometimes that will slip through the net. Um, quite often um, there'll be O's replaced with zeros and vice versa, or it'll just be a very simple misspelling. And so the title is normally a big giveaway. And equally, things like tax refunds, you'd never get a tax refund or an email anyway, but if you said tax refund exclamation mark, it's like, then they're gonna do that. They're not gonna put an exclamation mark at the end of the title. So the title's a big giveaway. Um, the, um, the other thing are, is that the body of the text anyway, that if you read it, quite often it's badly worded um, because quite often these people that aren't, uh, you know, they don't, aren't English or they don't speak brilliant English. And, um, and so it might not make perfect sense or it might just sound ridiculous. Like there's um, emails that say, you know, get your tax refund now or never get it sort of thing. And you just think, no, that, that wouldn't be right. Um, but also the other big thing is the links. If you really feel compelled to click on a link, hover over it first of all. And if you think it's going to Amazon.co.uk and you hover over it, you'll see a little highlight that will normally say going to dodgyvirusblokes.com or probably something less obvious. So generally speaking, the best thing is don't follow the links. If you want to go and check on your PayPal account, don't go directly to it. So these are the kind of emails that you're likely to see. Order acknowledgements for things you didn't order because that will scare people into clicking on the link. Um, often there'll be something really embarrassing where they don't want you to um, phone up and ask about it. I uh, had a customer once, um, he got something so embarrassing, he was really shy to uh, show it to me, but he did. It was, uh, they claimed he had ordered an Adele album. Um, so of course, uh, he didn't want to go phoning up about it in case he was recognized. Um, parking fines, that's a popular one. People stare at it and go, I didn't get a parking fine, click on the link. Doesn't occur to anybody that parking fine emails don't exist. I mean, they go, with the, I've seen loads of them. But they never send parking fine, they never send emails, they never send parking fines by email because they have got your email address. But people don't realise that because we're so used to getting emails. Um, one of those was this, the one that called out one of our clients and um, resulted in them having 20 grand taken out of their bank account. Tax refunds never happen, but you'll get loads of emails about it. All the bank account messages that come through, credit card, your credit card's been cancelled, your bank account's been closed all that stuff, phone them up or go directly to the website, but just don't trust the email. Important information about XYZ, Corona testing, uh, COVID-19 results, um, merchandise about, um, you know, to make you better or to protect you from this, that and the other. Some of it's so obvious, other things just look so official that you think like, oh, hang on a minute, could that be right? That looks like a government seal. Don't phone the number on that, Google it, phone it um, or just contact the support department if you're if you have any doubts if you think it is genuine your account has been hacked we know your password they display a password this is very popular and sometimes the passwords are correct because sometimes that it will be an account that's been hacked um, for example if you had linkedin or talk talk or ba accounts that have been hacked in the past and they've got your username and password, they're emailing you now to say, I've been on your computer, I know your password, it's this. Well, that might have been your talk talk password. But if you use the same password for everything, then of course that is a danger. Um, <laughs> what was that? Oh. Anyway, uh, oh yeah, I just, um, just realized I've got something open that shouldn't have opened in the background. Sorry about that. Uh, well, it was a chat window then, but it wasn't. Um, yeah, sometimes um, they'll claim they've got your password, but if you use the same password for everything, then you're automatically in danger anyway. But like I say, LinkedIn, BA, uh, talk to all of these people have been hacked and they have got a list of usernames and passwords. And, um, and they might be claiming that, that, that this is the one. Those emails are generally fake, but if it comes up with a password that you recognize, then go straight to your, um, uh, services that use that password and change them anyway. 
but don't contact the person that's threatening to expose you by showing people what's on your hard drive because that's just a load of waffle. One of my favorite ones that a client sent through was where um, the person said, I've, I know your dirty little secret. I've seen you hand partying. And she was <laughs> like, oh, I just love the expression, hand partying. <laughs> so, uh, so now every time I email her, I always start with a conversation with, with um, hand partying at the beginning, which I don't think makes her laugh at all. Anyway, um, <laughs> they're not real. Just delete it, but make sure you've got strong passwords elsewhere. Yeah, I, I had the exact thing a couple of months ago at work because um, obviously I'm paying bills, that sort of thing. Um, this, who I thought was a supplier, emailed me um, and he put, hi, Angela, blah, blah, blah. You know, it all looked official. All the details were on there. Um, oh, you haven't paid X amount of pounds yet. Um, please, can you transfer it into my bank account? Um, change of bank details. And it looked really... Yeah. you know really official and he had all the um uh proper sort of contacts and that sort of thing on it um and then when i rung him up he said no i haven't changed my bank details at all but it looked exactly as the invoice would have looked so yeah. i don't know how they did it but it was it was pretty good you yeah. know if i hadn't rung him up and just paid it i would have paid it into the wrong account people do um, yeah and then it's, yeah. It's, oh, we'll come to how that works in a little while what's slide for that yeah, <laughs> but, yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. But that is a, that's a brilliant Sorry, no. It is, yeah, but I mean, but you've done exactly the right thing. You phoned him. A lot of yeah. people, they just go, oh, change your bank details. And just, it's a lot easier. You can, yeah. the hassle solicitors have with this when it comes to conveyancy, because mm. all it takes is the change of bank details. And then there's, you know, hundreds of thousands of pounds being sent to the wrong guy. And it's always done with a TT, so it's nice and quick. And yeah. Then, yeah, that, that money's not seen again. So, um, yeah, whenever someone says about change of bank details, always double check it with um, a phone call. Or even um, there's these things, uh, I think they've got like a big crank handle on the side of them and they're steam powered, but they're called fax machines. Some people even use those. I don't know what that's all about it's before my time. Um, but, um, but yeah, confirming stuff by the phone, that's the way Yeah, it makes, you, makes you really nervous though, because you, you just, and then, you know, somebody else has sent bank details through, they think, Christ, you know, it, it does put you on edge because it looked really good what they'd sent across, you know. Yeah, yeah, definitely, um, yeah. Okay. And they yeah. Get, catch people out. Mm. Are you wanting mm. your microphone unmuted, Janice? Yeah. yeah, it's all right now, they're, they're occupied. Um, it, one of the things that I had, and I have it quite a lot, is um, people actually ask me to confirm the details in an email. And you're like, well, hang on a minute. He, how do you then know that's me? Who's yeah. done it? Yeah. So I, yeah. I, I hate it. And I, the amount of time online, the most recent one recently is that COVID 19 email. You've been, you know, we've had this, we've had that. You need to go on here and you need to sign this. But like, no, I'm not going anywhere near that. I just <laughs> don't even open them. That's the thing, that's all you can do is just be really cautious. Um, and at the end of the day, if, um, if people um, are sending genuine emails and you're not replying to them or you're deleting it because you think it's a scam, they'll get back to you. Okay. And they won't get back to you by email. Or they'll phone you. They'll phone you and go, well, why didn't you reply to my email? Because <laughs> that's what we all do. Mm. They get moody about it. And you get fed up after a certain point of someone ignoring you. You get your phone them up and say, why are you ignoring me? This is it, yeah. Well, you know that, Janice. But, um, yeah. Uh, so. <laughs> anyway, I just going to mute you again now. Uh, no reason. <laughs> but, uh, no. I ignore everything you send me. <laughs> yeah, uh, definitely. So, moving on. But needless to say, someone says your account's been hacked. Or another good email is one where it says um, uh, your, your email's been hacked. Click here to confirm or change your password. You know, we would never ask any of our clients to change their password that way. And um, if you have any doubt about any of that, you can phone, you know, the support number um, or generally, if it's completely different, um, then just you know, delete the email, but go directly to the website and investigate it directly with the merchant or you know, whoever it is that is um, supposedly emailing you or phone them. It is fine to phone them, like Amazon, um, PayPal I've spoken to, Google. I was amazed when I phoned Google um, how um, I resolved the issue in under four minutes. I know it's under four minutes because. Wow. Yeah, when I phoned them, that the recording said 
you'll uh, we'll call you back on this phone number in three minutes 17 seconds I was like what that's madness and yeah. um, then I hung up thinking I'll never hear from them again and I got a phone call back in three minutes it's like wow and then some yeah. Some girl was going, oh, thank you for reaching out. I said, I didn't, I just, <laughs> don't, don't accuse me of reaching out. Oh, I was socially distant at the time. Uh, but anyway, so um, sometimes just a phone call will do it. File attachments. Don't open any file attachments unless you are 100% sure that um, those emails are from the person they say they're from um, and that they should be opened. There's um, re-delivery emails, very popular, where they say, we missed your delivery. And of course, you get one of those in a moment, you're like, really? I don't think so. How could I have been out? <laughs> no one's could be, no one's out at the moment. But um, they say, you missed your delivery, fill out the form and, uh, and we'll arrange re-delivery. You fill it out and then what it does at the time is it gives you the um, uh, what's it called? crypto wall virus, encrypts all your files and then sends them away and then they uh, ransom the files back to you. Um, so people like UPS, DHL, USPS, which is another one, um, post office, all these ones are all scam emails, just delete it. If um, somebody is emailing you CVs applying for a job, that's a really scary one because they're people that you don't know. Um, and the file attachments, you know, the, the CVs are attachments and you don't know whether they're genuine. Um, so the only thing you can do is open it in a controlled environment, but just really read the email first because it might be dodgy. The problem is sometimes that you might get an email from a moron and it sounds dodgy uh, but um, but then if you're looking to employ somebody that's easy if, you, if they can't speak english well if english is supposed to be their first language and they can't speak it properly delete the email um macro viruses now a macro is an incredibly powerful um uh, thing that you can put into a lot of documents a word document an excel document a uh, PDF file, any kind of smart document, an AutoCAD file, where it automates all sorts of procedures. It's really handy. Um, and we did cover it briefly in Excel a while ago. And if you want to know more about it, just ask and I'll cover it again. Um, the problem is that um, if a colleague of yours sends you an Excel document you weren't expecting um, and it contains a macro, the problem with a macro is that not only can it do all useful things, it can do dangerous things as well, because sometimes those dangerous things like deleting files and moving files and emailing files are actually useful things that you want a macro to do. And so the antivirus software can't tell the difference. So if a colleague sends you a document that you weren't expecting, and then you open it up and it says enable macros, and you're like, yeah, sure, then it might be that your colleague has got um, a virus. So the important thing is, if you're not expecting a file, don't open it. If it's from someone that you know and you weren't expecting it, phone them before opening it. So it's important to be really cautious. Then we move on to um, spear phishing. Now spear phishing is um, not just the phishing emails, which all those last ones I've talked about were. Spear phishing is where it's a targeted attack, where they pinpoint somebody um, through something called social media scouring, and then they target you as a um, potential victim. So if you're the kind of person that goes on the Facebook, I mean, this is all irrelevant now, uh, but if you go on the Facebook going, oh, only seven days to my holiday, I can't wait to get away, I mean, only six days, and, um, and then you're finally away, then um, don't be surprised if somebody's been visiting the website burglemyhouse.com to bring up a list of all the people that are on holiday in your area. Um, but um, a spear phishing attack is normally pointed at somebody who says that daft kind of stuff and they're either financial controller or managing director or bookkeeper at a company um, and then they'll go onto LinkedIn and they'll find out who the other people in the company are and then the second the director's gone away they'll send an email pretending to be that director to the bookkeeper saying oh this invoice urgently needs paying because I'm just about to get on the plane and I forgot to do it. it's only 200 pounds sort it out today those are spear phishing attacks, a lot, amongst other kinds of spear phishing attacks. So just because somebody says um, they're somebody doesn't necessarily mean they are. And we've had lots of experiences like this. One of our clients had had a lot of expenses going out. They just moved offices um, and um, the uh, MD emailed um, the lady that does the accounts and said to her, um, what's the maximum we can transfer in a day? She said, oh, we can do uh, 250,000 a day. And then he emailed back, and I think it's, it's the usual figure they want, which is about 20 grand. So he emailed back and said, um, can you transfer 20 grand to this account? And she was like, yep, sure, fine. 
And so she was doing the transfer. She got to the point where it needed details of what it was for, because obviously it's a lot of money, you can't just say bills. And so she's on the banking screen, and just before putting the details in, she was about to email him back, and she's like, I can't remember. So she phoned him up, he said, yeah, this 20 grand, um, what's the reference? And he said, what 20 grand? She'd been having a communication with somebody <laughs> pretending to be him, um, but not him, and he didn't know anything about him. And had she not made that last minute phone call to confirm the payment, that would have gone. So sometimes people are really direct to these peer fiction attacks and they look really genuine. You should always make sure that when you come to paying your bill, unless it's us, don't pay it. No, you should always make sure that you have um, some form of um, double checking when you cross-reference things and you make sure you're not just sending money because just... you won't get it back. It is, um, the final thing about emails is if you get an email from somebody and you know it's dodgy or you just, if it's just spam, I mean, spam is the, the irritating stuff that isn't um, dangerous and phishing is the dangerous stuff. But if it's just spam and you think like, oh, I just want to get rid of it, I just going to unsubscribe, don't. Because you don't know that it's not phishing. It might look like spam, but actually be a malicious email. Or it might be from some company you've never heard of and you think, well, I don't want this you know, rubbish from this uh, Chinese company I've never heard of. And even if they're genuine, when you click on the unsubscribe button, it normally does it ask you to confirm your email address. So you confirm your email address and then it's like, well, hey, this is now a valid email address. It's been validated. We can sell it on. And so it goes on a database then and where you was getting one email, you'll now get thousands. So if you ever get an email that you don't want, whether it's a phishing email, a spam email, or just an email from someone you've never heard of, uh, or just an email from the boss, um, then don't click on subscribe, block it. And you can block it in Outlook if you haven't got um, a virus blocker, if you haven't got a, um, a proper blocker in place. Or if you're using our email system, you can use MailGuard. If you want to know more about that, just ask and I'll explain how it's done. That's emails. Moving swiftly on. <laughs> video conferencing. Yay, the wacky world of video conferencing. Now, anyone who attended my first video conference of this um, particular lockdown. Well, no, I did it in Zoom. Oh, Zoom's brilliant. It's free. It's great. It's so fast. It's so easy. It's so much um, more efficient than, um, uh, than Microsoft Teams, which is just like going to the dentist. Oh, no, I mean, like Microsoft Teams is, oh, I'll just put a disclaimer in there somewhere. Anyway, um, <laughs> The problem with Zoom though is what they do is they don't worry about all that rubbish about security and keeping it safe and making sure that people can't see the video stream. At least this is what I've been told. It says it's encrypted, but I'm not sure how effective that encryption is. It says it's free, um, but I'm fairly certain from what I've read that they, it's funded by sharing details with Facebook. So it's one thing when you start typing messages or it's one thing you start surfing the net and looking for a product and then you get Google adverts based on the product. But it's another thing when you're having a conversation like this and then suddenly you start getting Google ads or Facebook adverts or all kinds of other adverts about things you're talking about. That means someone's actually sitting there watching the video. Um, and this is the big problem with Zoom, which is really worrying that um, people like politicians are using it. I would have said that though. Mm. Who on earth wants to watch politicians waffle on about you know, PPE and all that kind of stuff? The only upside of that is hearing politicians saying PP because that's mildly amusing. But after the first 10 times, they get so boring. But, um, but yeah, Zoom is, is not um, currently something that I would recommend as being safe because of these issues where your data is not, um, is not uh, protected, it's being shared. The other thing is people have found um, huge, great um, uh, security issues with the technology where people have hacked into it and been able to get, on, get onto other people's, you know, um, people, um, start again, people have hacked into it and got onto uh, attendees' hard drives and accessed their files. And so if someone says to you, oh yeah, do you want to do a Zoom meeting at the weekend or do you want to just all get together at a Zoom party, which is really popular at the moment, then you have to be really cautious about that. I'm not suggesting that you shouldn't do, you know, anything that involves, you know, having a nice uh, chat with friends and things, but um, but be aware of the dangers. And if you have to use Zoom, 
maybe use it on a tablet that doesn't have company data on it. Maybe use it on a, on a mobile phone that doesn't have company data or secure data. But I'm certainly shy away from using it on a PC um, and particularly a PC where you've got important data on there because at the moment it's not something that can be recommended as a, a thoroughly secure and safe product. And then you get the quiz. That's really scary. That's really scary because for ages I use Zoom. I haven't for the last sort of month or so, but I use Zoom quite a lot with Lisa. And it's yeah. like, mm. Loads of people are using it. I mean, if I was given the opportunity to do something on Zoom which I couldn't resist, then I've got a laptop, I've got a tablet I could use for that. And I know there's no company data on there. But I don't want to put myself in a situation where someone could get on my hard drive my laptop it's too dangerous so it's just important about being um being aware of these things um, and the other a, lot thing, of, a lot of therapists are starting to do it aren't they with zoom a lot of the therapists are starting to do their their, their sort of sessions on on zoom they are i mean well, lots of people do lots of stuff it because it's free and it works really well you can get free accounts with um uh, microsoft teams now yeah. And that is really, really challenging to make it work the way you want it to work because it's a quality Microsoft product and it's slow. It's so resource hungry. But that, that What about uh, Skype? Well, Skype for Business is, is Microsoft Teams effectively. And right. Skype for regular Skype is not as secure as Skype. I don't know, they just, they sell it as saying, well, Skype is, is great, but it's not as good as using Skype for business, which is Teams. Me personally, I'm a big fan of Cisco products because this is old, boring, established security. It's really locked down tight, it works really well. It used to cost quite a lot to use, but at the moment they've, they've um, allowed people to use it for free with some of, uh, some of the features cut back. So I can highly recommend WebEx, and as you can see, it works really well. It's easy. Um, it's not as easy as, as um, Zoom, but that's because it's um, a little bit more technical. How do you? Can you just go to their website then? Yeah, you just go to it and um, click on the um, the section that says free account uh, during this um, terrible time. We'll just pat ourselves on the back. Um, but, um, but I've been using this for years. I, mean, I signed up for years ago for training and stuff, and it's always been a really good product. So uh, and it, they got the years behind them of, of established security protocols as well. Whereas these new things, like House Party on, on mobile phones, is really popular. Um, <laughs> uh, they haven't got the, um, the, the the background experience of knowing what should be secure and how to stop people from going, exiting out of House Party and then hacking people's Netflix accounts. Um, However, moving on to uh, the, the final thing about video conferencing, no, not about video conferencing, about um, Zoom um, chats. One of the popular things people do apparently are quiz nights on Zoom. Now, any kind of quizzes, we'll come to this again on social media, you should be really cautious with. If you're sitting there answering questions about Coronation Street or EastEnders or whatever, that's fine. But when you suddenly get electronic quizzes where people want to know about your mother's maiden name and what your first pet was, then you think, hang on a minute, <laughs> this is a bit dodgy. But you'd be surprised, people do get lured into it. And have a complete stranger chatting to them on a video conference, and the next thing they know, all their bank accounts have been emptied. Um, however, we'll get back to that later. So, a couple of other things on this then. Um, be cautious of what you share, because sometimes you might say things on a video call uh, that you think they're forgotten about, but of course this is recorded and kept forever in many cases. And so, um, so, you know, if you say something that is, uh, uh, should be kept secure, then, uh, you know, that, that doesn't go away. Um, but also visually, you can be concerned about things that you visually have. So behind you, you know, you might have um, uh, company data or personal data that can be seen because the quality of cameras these days is really good. People can take a screen image and zoom in. And like I was saying um, a few days ago about all these people on TV, there was um, sit there in front of their bookcases now. And it's like, if you've got your camera positioned and you're sort of like half handed on the edge of the desk, just so that you can get your bookcase into the image to make you look clever, um, have a quick scan of your books first. It's no good if you've got your complete works of the L. James there, and everyone's going, you've got 50 shades of grey on your bookshelf. <laughs> and, uh, complete illustrated Farmer Sutra, yeah, Farmer Sutra, where, yeah, this is not gonna be a bookcase <laughs> if we're trying to look clever in a business meeting. 
So, um, so yeah, be cautious of what's going on behind you as well. A great tool for this, one of Microsoft's really good um, uh, inputs in this thing, in both Teams, Skype for Business and Skype, they've got the blur feature. And um, you, you click on that, and then what happens is you'll just see your face and the background will be blurred. And that works really well, it's very clever. I mean, I regularly have drinking sessions with a mate of mine uh, who lives thousands of miles away um, on Skype. And then we'll sit there on, on our respective um, uh, screens chatting away, having a few beers, and, it, and it's just like being in the room because we can still talk rubbish and drink. Um, but um, that's a great use of Skype because there's no security issues. But with that, I mean, I did try the blur feature the other day, but it really didn't matter because after a few San Miguel's, it was all blurry anyway, so it doesn't, <laughs> doesn't make a lot of difference. But in meetings, <laughs> if you're having a Skype meeting or a Teams meeting, that's a nice feature to switch on. Online purchases. Everyone knows about the dangers and these things. I'm taking a lot longer than I expected, so much for 20 minutes. Credit cards are always better than using debit cards because uh, it's, you know, you're still responsible for it, but at the end of the day, credit cards are their money, debit cards are your money. Um, it's much better for them, for them. You get a much better level of protection from a credit card normally. Um, if you've got any option of turning on two-factor authentication for any service, especially financial ones, just say yes. Now, um, this can happen with some banks, some credit <laughs> cards, um, uh, some online providers, all sorts of people say, oh, we offer two-factor authentication, or we will see it at the profile, and you think, what's 2FA? I don't know what that is, I don't want any of these things. Basically, what two-factor authentication does, is when you switch it on, um, in addition to you answering the questions about your password or putting your password in, it will sometimes use another method of authentication on a different device, like they'll send you a text, and then you have to type that number in as well. Or they'll ask you've got an app on your phone, or generate a number there. And so certain credit card companies will send you a text that you have to type in when you're buying something. And it's just an extra level of protection. So if you get the opportunity to turn on two-factor authentication, if you see it mentioned anywhere in your profile or account screen, switch it on or, or press help and learn about it, because it's definitely worth using. A really popular one, a popular scam, is that you'll get people selling things on eBay and uh, or on other services where any, any service where people take money and they'll say to you, oh, oh yeah, can you pay us using PayPal friends and family um, or family and friends or whatever it's called. Um, there's a method on PayPal where you can pay somebody who's family or friends and then no one gets charged. So they'll sell a car for five grand or whatever and they say, yeah, yeah, I'll take the, the payment through PayPal. If you pay them normally, they'll pay, I don't know, 5% or 10% of that in PayPal fees. But if they say, do the family and friends fix, there's no fees. Then you send the money, then they just, you send five grand, they get five grand. Brilliant. Sounds like a brilliant thing. And if you're doing it with family and friends, it is brilliant. Mute you there. Oh, no. I'll unmute you again. Um, <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> yeah, so for family and friends, it's fine. But if you do it to a stranger and then you're going to pick the car up, well, I've got this car for five grand, it's a bargain. Where's the car? There's no car. That's well, okay. I bought it for eBay. I did it through PayPal. PayPal will say, well, no, that's not our problem. He's a friend or a member of your family. You get no protection if you pay that way. So if an online seller says to you, oh, you know, we'll give you a 5% discount if you do PayPal family and friends then say, no, you're right, I'll do normal PayPal or not at all, or credit card. Um, anything where you enter your credit card details, if you look at the URL and all the address bar at the top, if it says HTTP and doesn't say PS, um, and it hasn't got a padlock, don't enter secure data in there, enter credit card details. Even if you've got a VPN, still don't do that because any data that's entered into an HTTP website can be seen in plain text by anyone in the world, anyone at all who wants to track that data stream. And if you're entering your credit card details in, or you're getting an insurance quote, and you're entering when you the details of when your house is empty, well, they would be anymore, but uh, <laughs> if you're putting details like that and then submitting it through the internet, then that plain text can be read by anybody. If it says HTTPS and it's got a little padlock, it doesn't mean they're super genuine, it just means the information is encrypted and encapsulated and sent in a secure manner to their server. And the other thing is just when you're buying stuff, make sure it's a real thing because a lot of products aren't. 
it sounds too good to be true, it probably isn't, or is, or whatever the right wording for that is. Um, you know, there's on our own Facebook, I don't really use Facebook um, for a variety of reasons, but on there, people are always getting their accounts hacked, and then suddenly they're offering people great bad sunglasses for a fiver a go. They're not real, that's why they're only a fiver a go. So, invoice scams. Now, you'd be shocked to hear this, but sometimes. Um, email, invoices get uh, emails get intercepted, invoices get changed, and they get a fake, a fake bank details put on them. <laughs> so, yeah, amazing that. Yeah. So, yeah. In, every, in any method at all, if someone says they change their bank details, check with them directly. The technology that people are using is, um, is actually quite a basic technology, it's really effective these days, really effective um, ways of intercepting emails or just copying an email and making a fake version that looks just like it. Um, sometimes they'll have a similar domain name where they just created their own domain. Um, so instead of being blogs.co.uk, it'd be blogs, blogsco.co.uk, and then it will look just like it's from the normal person. And it might be a customer or a disgruntled customer of that company or an ex-employee or somebody who's just seen an email from them. Um, you have no idea who it could be, but they can be pretending to be a company or they could be grabbing an email or it's going through the internet, changing it and then sending it the rest of the way. Email is not secure. Doesn't matter how good their system is, how good your system is, the bit between your two servers, the bit in the outside world, email is a plain text and be grabbed and read by anybody. So you should never send secure information by email. And things like invoices and payment details and bank details, um, you should never take them as uh, face value. Come that moved on. <laughs> yeah, you should do that. Someone's not um, acting to uh, my system. Anyway, so that's invoice scam. So be really cautious of uh, paying stuff just based on an email. Phone them first. WhatsApp scams. I'm really concerned about what that moved on now. It might be that fly standing on my keyboard. Um, the um, the wonder that is WhatsApp. Does anyone use WhatsApp? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, everybody, brilliant. I use it all the time. Fantastic, great piece of uh, technology. Takes away all the complications and aggravations and bloatware of using something like Skype, but gives you all the advantages and all the efficiency of just jolly well communicating with people. And it's encrypted and secure and brilliant. However, um, there are some issues. First of all, um, there's loads of scams, just like emails. But these scams are brilliant because what people will do is somebody somewhere along the line will get a Sainsbury's free £250 voucher. Oh, wow, they're just throwing £250 away. Amazing. Morrison's have got a voucher for that or a free PA flight. All they want you to do is click on this link. But somebody will get that from someone they probably don't even know or just by accident. And then they'll think to themselves, oh, I'll forward this to my friends. I'll WhatsApp it to them. And then you get it from a friend, so it's a trusted source, and they'll tell you they've got in there and signed up because they're stupid. And you believe them <laughs> because we're all stupid. Um, <laughs> and it's a scam. And you click on something like morrisonsuk.net or saintsbeesrewards.com or Tesco's or whatever, and you go in there, and it'll be the same as all the other scams. It moved on again all by itself. It must have a timer set up. Mm. <laughs> But um, so is it the WhatsApp when you do a WhatsApp video call? Would that be okay then? Because it's secure or not? Is that still we, got the same issue? Oh, we'll get to what's secure in just a minute. Um, but um, you know, just don't, if you get a message offering you money, or offering you free stuff, don't don't um, be sucking into it. Because even if it, your friend is genuinely um, forwarded to you because they believe it's real, it isn't real, okay? There's other ones like um, um, there's a one going around saying um, uh, WhatsApp are going to start charging again. They used to charge 99p a year when it first came out, and they'll say just pay a fiver and have it free for life. And then of course they want you to come in there, get your credit card details. I mean all the things that they can do once you've logged, in, once you follow the link, are numerous. But um, but basically they're not real. Don't follow the links. It's never going to be um, a charge for service again because it's owned by Facebook and they've got far too much money anyway. Um, so uh, they would know what to do with more money. They're not going to charge you for this. So all of those things are just like email scams. Just be really um, cautious about it. 
The other thing though is intercepted messages. WhatsApp is brilliant because it's encrypted and secure. Much to the frustration of the governments of the world and the bad guys and all these people, when your message gets sent from your device, it's secure right the way up to the other device, all the way through the internet, it can't be seen, they can't read what you're sending. But the device at the other end might not be the device you think it is. Somebody might have stolen that mobile phone, or even easier than that, somebody might have just got the MAC address. Without going into too much depth, because I've got a longer than expected anyway, um, the way WhatsApp works, the way it's so quick and efficient, the reason you can only have it on one device at a time is because it works by the MAC address. Every computer, every device that attaches to the internet has a media access control address, not the IP address, a unique address that's hardware written into the chip that says, I am who I say I am, I'm this thing. And that's the way WhatsApp, in simple terms, that's the way WhatsApp works. And so um, it basically means that if somebody gets someone's uh, MAC address, then they can pretend to be that person. They can get onto their WhatsApp account, because they don't have accounts in WhatsApp, you just have that MAC address. Um, and they can, it's easy, with a PC, it's easy to spoof a, a mobile phone um, and pretend to be on a mobile phone with that MAC address. Um, and then they can see, read all the messages, they can have conversations with you. And if you have a conversation with somebody that you believe to be someone that you know, and they just don't sound right, they sound odd, and don't seem, you know, text-based conversation, they don't seem like they normally see, it might mean that they've been scammed. And then um, what you should do is just phone them up or do a video call because then you'll know um, who they are. Normally what happens then is your friend answers the call and then they'll normally say, I didn't ask you for money. And then at that point, they need to report it. Um, the problem is, what, or the way this tends to happen is um, people use public Wi-Fi and they're attached to a dodgy Wi-Fi system, a free dodgy Wi-Fi. And then those routers keep a list of all the people that are connected especially if you're abroad and it's like some dodgy cyber cafe or something, or, or not even cyber cafe, dodgy cafe or restaurant or something. They get a list of MAC addresses, and then some shysters will just try using those MAC addresses and seeing which ones have got WhatsApp accounts attached to them. And um, I was doing this presentation a while ago, and um, one of the attendees in the course said, that happened to me. She said, I was getting these messages from my dad. And she said, it was really weird. I could tell it wasn't him because he was spelling properly and sounded articulate, kind of all charming. <laughs> and then she said, um, I think was he'd been to Mallorca or somewhere and used the free Wi-Fi. And after that, she was getting all these blooming fake WhatsApp uh, messages from him. Um, and normally it's people trying to borrow money or asking if they can borrow your password, which of course is ridiculous. And then once they've got, if they get your password from Facebook, then they get out to all sorts of shenanigans and it, uh, all the results and extortion and other stuff. Just be cautious. Use WhatsApp. <clears throat> don't um, don't uh, take any risks with it. So quiz time! Yay! I think the best part when I only get here. Um, <laughs> when is it safe to attend a Zoom video conference? Never. Never. Yeah. yeah. When you're, you're like, <laughs> when you're bothering again. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. If you've got to do it, you've got to do it. But just be aware that there are dangers attached. Um, what should you do if you're offered a discount on eBay for paying by PayPal friends and family? Don't do it. Don't do it. Anything they're about it, report them to, to uh, eBay. Or any other I've seen here. <laughs> yeah. um, if you keep receiving the same spam email and you just get annoyed with it, what should you do? Block it. Block, Block it. it. Don't unsubscribe. Block it. And a friend contacts you on WhatsApp and asks to borrow money, what should you do? Oh, no. <laughs> or better still, just ignore them. Even if they're standing next to you yeah. and, just, um, and you know that they're real, uh, just, just, just <laughs> don't know, unless it's me. But uh, no, just, just don't get involved in it. Um, and is it okay to give out your wireless key to anybody that comes to the house? No. no. Just don't do it. <laughs> Moving on. Uh, social media, as I like to call it, the ultimate virus. If I was going to invent two things to destroy Western society, it'd be fast food and Facebook. It's not that I don't like the things, but I'm just saying they're really damaging. Uh, yeah, Facebook it is such a real um, drain of your time, but not just Facebook, all the other social medias. But as I said earlier, be really cautious of online quizzes. There's people, there was someone yesterday I was chatting to, and they said, oh, I've got a quiz come up on my phone. I was like, oh, really? Because they interrupted the call conversation, not actually see people anymore. Um, and they're going to, it's about mothers' mobile names. 
And I was like, what? <laughs> Isn't he stupid? <laughs> 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 that. Um, but, but there will be people out there who will just be so bored because they're stuck at home and they'll start giving away details of their first pet, you know, or their, the, the memorable places they've been to on holiday. I mean, it's just, you know, a fraudster's dream. I'm talking about fraudster's dreams. For some reason, some you get these guys that just seem like the perfect bloke on all these different social media platforms. And um, I don't know, a number of um, people I've spoken to, you know, really intelligent, nice, sensible women that are like in business and stuff. And they go, oh, I bet it's a really nice guy online. Oh, but he, he can't get out of his obligations at work at the moment. He just needs me to send him 10 grand. I'm like, really? Oh, <laughs> <He's>, <laughs> yeah. They're not even that good looking. It's like, oh, I could even get a date without one. To, without, if I was sending him 10 grand, <laughs> let alone. I don't know how they do it. But, um, but people fall for it. I know someone the other day, she, she ended up sending someone like 14. It's a real person. She sent 14 grand in total to this bloke. Oh, I said, he's oh, not a real person. They said, she even showed me a picture of him. She goes, oh, he's really nice. I said, it's not even that good looking. <laughs> that's, that's not him. You're sending your money to so, a, a team of people working at a call centre in Somalia. It's not yeah. a real person. But all the time that, um, that uh, you know, people are stuck at home, and bored, the bad guys are up in their game. I mean, blokes obviously fall for this sort of stuff because they would just be happy to get attention from a woman of any kind. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, they're dreamed out. But, um, but yeah, just, you know, if any of that stuff, report it to the, to the site or any friends of, your, of yours that say, oh, I bet this perfect person. No, tell them that um, they're probably not the real thing. Um, <laughs> And obviously, you know, there's so much stuff you have to fact check these days on social media because just because somebody tells you that everyone's gone back to work doesn't mean you can leave the house ever again. It's probably not real. Double check. Um, right, moving on. Non-computer scams. I'll get through this as quickly as possible. Phone calls. When Microsoft phone you to tell you your computer's running slow, it's not Microsoft. Hopefully you know that. And it's the same with Mike McAfee or anyone else says, you got a virus. It's not real. BT. My friend, my friend had it, and he really believed. He found me out. I was like, "It's not real. It's yeah. Seriously, it's not real." Yeah. Go Please on. don't tell me you gave me details. I'm not going to tell you the name of the customer because, um, uh, in case they, um, in case they're not seeing this video, but he's a sensible bloke, and he got duped by BT phoning up to say that they were putting in his um, his fibre optic. And then he gave them, when they, when they said they couldn't do it and they just needed his bank account to send through, um, his bank account details so they could send through a, um, a, a bit of uh, compensation, he just handed out the details like he was handing out sweets. And they went straight in there and lifted tens of thousands. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, those phone calls are not genuine. And if it's on a landline and they say, oh, hang up and phone back, and you hang up and phone back on the landline, they're probably still there. They'll even play, play a dial tone to make it sound like they're still there. So phone back from uh, your mobile. If the bank phone, they say, we need to do a security check before uh, talking to you, then say, well, no, <laughs> and hang up and phone back from your mobile. Quite often they'll say, yeah, we was phoning to talk about your overdraft or we was phoning to talk about your interest rates. Um, yeah. But normally, um, but sometimes they'll say, no, we haven't got any calls left against your name. So you just got to be really cautious. Very popular one at the moment, unexpected deliveries. Um, if you get an unexpected delivery, don't accept it. And if you do accept it, um, then put it in a corner and question it, contact the provider. Now, um, I'll tell you the story behind this one because people are getting caught out all the time on this. What happens, you get a knock at the door, yeah, it's a delivery. I wasn't expecting anything, but yeah, it's great. And, um, the guy hands it over, all your details on it, it looks genuine, so you sign for it, not a problem. Um, tear it open, it's a couple of iPhones in there. Think, well, I didn't order these iPhones. Um, and then before you even get time to question it, there's another knock at the door and it's either, uh, yeah, it's another bloke, probably the same guy, I don't know, he's got delivery stuff on. Uh, and he's there with another clipboard going, yeah, really sorry, we delivered the wrong stuff. Um, I, can I just uh, give, the, I, I've got to sign it and take that back and give you this. And you're like, yeah, 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 whatever, do all that and it's done. Nothing, yeah, nothing to worry about there. In a few minutes. What actually happens is it starts with somebody getting your details. Maybe they've got your bank account details from um, a hacked account, or maybe they've seen it somewhere. 
or maybe they've just got um, your address and phone number and something off social media or off the electoral register, and they go into um, car phone warehouse. No, they do it online because it wouldn't go in anywhere at the moment. Um, so they go online, they create an account with your name, address, and all your details, and they order two most expensive mobile phones they can get. Yeah, yeah a couple of brand new, top of the range iPhones. Ones that are worth like 1,200 quid a go, or whatever they cost these days. They sign up for the 100 pound a month contract on each of them. They don't care about any of that. They do all that in your name. And then they pay the premium delivery to get it delivered to your house in the one hour slot on a certain day. Um, and then um, they put those things straight on Facebook, straight on eBay. They're for sale already, starting price £500 a go. Then they sit outside your house, waiting for the delivery driver to turn up. In olden times, when we used to leave our houses, um, they would hope that you weren't there, and they'd intercept the delivery driver and go, oh, thank goodness, you've, I've, I've just caught you. They'll sign a bit of paper, take a delivery, and then they'll go straight to the post office to send these things on, and they've just sold for 500 quid a go. Um, or now what they do is they sit outside, they wait for the delivery driver to give you the package and you sign for it. And they turn up with the baseball cap on the little delivery thing or the clipboard and they go, oh, sorry, wrong delivery. And they take the box away and then they go to the post office and post those out to the people they sold them to on eBay. And they're guaranteed, like say, £500 a go for these, maybe even about £800. And then a month later, you get your first bill. And you're like, well, what's all this about? I didn't uh, sign up for these contracts. These were collected. And you get on the phone to the car phone warehouse. And they say, well, no, you signed for it. We've got your order here. We've got your delivery. You signed for the delivery there. And you go, well, no, it's collected. And they're like, well, we don't know anything about a collection, but you signed for it. You're liable for over a couple of grand's worth of iPhones. And that is the popular scam at the moment. And it will be all sorts of products, but anything that they can um, sell quickly. And that person would be in and out like a, like a flash, and you won't know where those phones went, you won't know who that guy was, that'll be it. So if somebody's got a package for next door, that's fine. They've got a package you're expecting, sure. But if you get a package and you think, I didn't order this, um, or even if you just end up signing for it um, and you didn't order it, whatever you do, don't let it go. Don't give it back. Because if they look genuine, you say, oh, no, I need to find out about this. Phone the person that sent it first, tear it open, and, um, and phone up and inquire about it. So that's a, a new popular one that's uh, doing the rounds. Things to stay protected with. I'm glad this was a special presentation. Yeah. Strong unique passwords. You need to have a different password for everything because if your account gets hacked on TalkTalk, Talk, um, you don't want it to be the same password that you use for paper. Um, you can't write the passwords down or put it in a Word document or store it on your desktop because if you store it electronically, the bad guys will get it. I always forget to mute my phone. Um, if you've got a device that you've just bought from somewhere and it's got a, um, a technical nature to it, you need to make sure um, that if there's a password on it, that default password needs to be changed and then um, then it adds a level of protection. There's all sorts of techniques you can use to um, make your password unique, but make it memorable. Um, but we can talk about that another time, I'm not running on so much. Um, other ways to stay protected, keep your operating system up to date, whether it's your PC, your telephone, tablet, devices. If it says it's doing an update or it wants to do an update, let it do it. If it looks dodgy, phone us up and we'll investigate whether it's genuine or not and back up your data doesn't matter how good your pc is whether it's your home pc your work pc or the pc that you're working from home doing work stuff um, the data on that needs to be backed up if you haven't got a normal backup in place then um, if you're one of our clients then you'd also have a cloud station account which you may or may not know about at least with a cloud station account it's a backup it's backed up off site doesn't matter how good your device is or um how uh, you know, well protected it is. If your laptop gets stolen or bursts into flames, the data won't be available to you anymore. <laughs> so it needs to be backed up off-site. GDPR, we're nearly there, <laughs> which is almost the last slide. We all know about GDPR, don't we? Yeah. No, it's quietened down about GDPR quite a lot now, isn't it? Yeah, because uh, yeah, no one cares anymore. Um, but you need to get <laughs> 
because people are still getting fined for data breaches and people get in a lot of trouble. And it's still a 20 million euro um, fine for anyone that um, needs it pushing to the limit. A few key things, emails. If you're having email conversations and you're about to forward that email on to somebody else, just double check the contents of it first. Make sure that it's, you're not forwarding the conversation that you've had with somebody else and don't have their permission to forward on. That can happen quite easily. Um, video conferencing, as I said earlier, it's all been left over a bookshelf behind you, but if you've got like a bunch of files behind you and there's a list of your clients and, you, and people might not want to know, might not want people to know that Janice is taking care of their accounts, um, <laughs> then um, don't keep the files um, in the video shop. Um, there's nothing secure there, is there, Janice, behind you? No. I'll have to zoom in on that and have a look. Do you want some pic pictures that my son's done? All right. Um, I, Hoover. I, no. Hoover's <laughs> there. <laughs> okay. No. Right. This is the sort of thing I would do to have a bunch of clients. Exciting. And then client names across them. That would be, that'd be perfect. Um, I was about careless talking. Okay. Be really cautious what you say about it. Because if you use an example of um, one of your suppliers and then they find out that you've been talking about them and it's on YouTube, they might get moody. Um, and... Um, Encryption and password protection. If you password protect stuff on your laptop, that's great. And if your password, if your laptop itself is password protected, that's great. But it needs to be encrypted because um, if you haven't got encryption and the bad guys get hold of your laptop, there's ways of getting past the passwords. And so your hard drive needs to be encrypted. It's the only way to guarantee that it is secure. If it's something we provided, it's most likely that it will be encrypted. If you want that checked, contact the support department. <laughs> they love that. Um, <laughs> PCs, phones, tablets, all of these things need to be encrypted and secured. Well, actually, most phones and tablets these days will be encrypted anyway. It's part of the operating system. But it's no good having company emails on your company, on your personal mobile phone, um, and then not password protecting it. Otherwise, you end up like Onion Man from two days ago. You know about Onion Man? <laughs> the guy whose kid picked up his mobile phone and then used the delivery app to order an onion. And he received the <laughs> onion and it only cost him 20 pounds because of all the surcharges for the size of the order. Um, that was a 20 quid mistake. But if you leave your mobile phone laying around and a bad guy gets hold of it and you haven't got it password protected and he's got your company emails, uh, that can be a, a lot more damaging than 20 pounds. Online data storage. It's a great way of backing stuff up because um, it means that it's stored off site, but be cautious of where um, your data is being stored. If you're using something um, that's not GDPR compliant, then it could mean that in the event of a data breach, you are responsible for the loss of data. Our cloud station service is GDPR compliant. So um, if you haven't got anywhere else to stick your data, sticking in there is not a bad place to uh, consider. That's about it for GDPR. Um, so quiz time, what should you do if you want to, if you want, if you receive an unwanted delivery? Hold on to it. Fine. Don't accept it, or if you accidentally accept it, don't let it go. Um, what are the rules about passwords? Make sure they're encrypted. <laughs> yeah, make sure you've got different ones for everything. Oh, and yeah. you don't write them down. That's the key bit. Uh, where's a good place to back up your data? Cloud. In the cloud, yeah, or using our cloud station system, or preferably our online backup system. And is a password enough to protect your laptop data? No. No, it needs to be encrypted as well. And is it okay to not have a screen lock on your mobile phone? No. <laughs> Got to be locked because even if it's just your personal one, you don't want to end up with twenty quid on you. 